Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 228th episode of the CodeCast Podcast. My name is Terry Fletcher. I hope everyone's doing great today. We are at the first day of March 2022. How How exciting is that? I can't believe we're in March already. Yes, my daughter's getting married in 20 days. I'm freaking out a little bit, but you know what? I'm going to try and be calm. (laughs) Anyway, today we're going to look at an interesting topic. I've been asked to uh, do some, or I should say podcast on some topics that have to do with auditing and auditing flags. Now, I mention audits in a lot of my podcasts, but I actually don't do any kind of breakdown or give you some insight if you're doing your own internal audits, or let's say that you're someone that just got your your auditing credential or you're now you have now been assigned to audit. And so I you know, in these requests, I've had a lot of people giving me some feedback on things that they're going through. And I just wanted to give you some basics today that I go through when auditing the record and also some red flags that can come back to bite you if you're not careful. And so we just we want to make sure that you're on the up and up. Otherwise, there could be some backlash. Uh, And you also want to be confident in how you're auditing. So make sure that you have some kind of tool in front of you. Now, when we think of auditing, most of us think right away E&M services, so evaluation and management, or the visit codes, whether it be office, another outpatient, or hospital visits, or you know, um, observation, anything like that. But we also audit procedures as well. We audit critical care. Uh, we audit shared visits now. There's all kinds of things that we can audit or review or take a look at. And when I audit, I'm just not auditing for compliance and to make sure that the documentation supports the code that was billed. If I'm do, doing a uh, retro audit or, re- and, or retrospective is what they call it, or if it's a prospective, meaning that I'm auditing it before it leaves the building, uh, typically level fives, I have a couple of clients that have us do that, um, then what am I looking for specifically also with supporting? that record. Well, I'm also looking to see if they time the visit to see if maybe prolonged care, if it's a level five could be added. I'm looking to see if there's consistency throughout the note. That's a really big deal because sometimes I'll see something in the history, even though we don't use the history and exam anymore in office visits to level the service, we do use it to make sure that um, there's medical necessity because that still is the key to supporting and to submitting a claim. You still have to make sure that the presenting problem, why the patient came in, is supported in the documentation. And it's hard to support just medical decision making if you don't have a way to show that you evaluated the patient. The other thing I've noticed is that a lot more um, providers are using scribes. And one of the things that came in, also medical assistance, um, they've that's come in is this question and it says one of the certified medical assistants um, that my practice sometimes helps out as a scribe okay remember a scribe is just a note taker they cannot add any advice any medical decision making any kind of management nothing they're basically verbatim taking the notes of what the physician is verbalizing during that encounter and it said uh, I've noticed that he sometimes adds notes pertaining to the exam assessment and treatment to the record of an encounter before it begins. Okay, how is that possible? And the requester or the person asking this question says, this doesn't seem okay, and I want to be sure that I'm on the right track before I say something. Not only should you say something, but talk about this loaded with complaints and red flags. How can a CMA or or any clinician or, or a scribe or anybody really anticipate what will happen in an encounter before it even happens. And that's where we get into the cut and paste and clone notes nonsense that we I was hoping we were kind of done with. But I still see it in every note that I audit. A lot of templates haven't been updated uh, from the 20, anything before 2021. And so we still see a lot of information brought forward. But I understand that cloning notes saves times, cutting and pasting, but it's unethical and can cause a lot of headaches down the road. Remember, a patient's record, including documentation of their visits with their healthcare professional, is the narrative that informs their current and future of care. So if you copy or clone notes from the past, 
that you really don't know if they're relevant to the current uh, encounter or even future information, then it's not accurate. And it, and it can actually skew treatment the patient receives later. And it also can um, be a problem when it comes to ethics and if it's ever looked at, especially from an auditing perspective. So it, it's like a physician that just lists the, um, the patient's prescriptions and says that's prescription drug management. I don't think so. If you just put re refill per EMR, I wouldn't give you credit for a moderate visit because first of all, that's not management. Management means that you are making sure that the patient is taking those prescriptions correctly, that they're not interacting with other medications, maybe other providers are also prescribing for the patient, and that you're giving uh, information on whether or not that patient is gonna continue with those medicines and why, or they're gonna discontinue those medicines and why. So always keep in mind that you can't just jump right to that, um, I guess that moderate level just because they say, you know, refills prescribed or prescriptions continue with. You have to have that management concept there. Which brings me to one of my tips today when it comes to looking at uh, auditing. So for those of you just starting in it, Here's something that is starting, I'm starting to see in a lot of medical records that's actually driving me crazy. <laughs> so here's something that I see all the time. It says level of service medical decision making. And it says, and it says colon, it says, I reviewed the patient's past medical history, social history, review of systems and past family and social history is appropriate. Uh, the risk of the presenting problem is moderate. Well, how do you know? So I saw another one that says I reviewed the patient's past family social history, updated as appropriate, data reviewed outside medical records, the risk of presenting problems is moderate, and the risk of management is moderate. Okay, so have you ever heard the phrase that if you have to toot your own horn, then there's something wrong that that's not who you are? It's the same thing with what I do. There, you, you rarely will, will hear me self-promote in a way that I hear other people do that because to me, your work, your record, everything that you do should speak for itself. It's when I hear professional athletes, for example, say something like, you know, I'm the greatest or I, you know, I'm the best at this position. Well, you shouldn't be the one saying that. Other people should be saying that. And that's the same, in my opinion, with the medical record. You don't put in a medical record and say that a generic statement that this is moderate and I, I'm concerned for some of the new auditors out there because they'll look at that and say, oh, well, the doctor said it was moderate, so it was moderate. Not necessarily. What makes it moderate is making sure you're meeting the level of the requirements for moderate medical decision making. Did you have one or more chronic illnesses with an exacerbation that was well documented? Um, did you have two or more stable chronic illnesses that shows that physician is actually addressing those problems and commenting on that? Did you have an undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis where testing and that patient had to be worked up? Uh, an acute complicated injury. And then we get into data points. I mean, you have to have something that reflects at least a completed category, meaning did you have test documents or independent historian that you had three from all those different sources? One of the things I saw or I was reviewing in the data points, it said outside medical records and results of medical uh, record and medical record testing gone over the patient. That was it. Okay, what were those outside records? What did they say? And what results did you discuss with the patient? Because the only thing the physician said after that is the risk of data points is moderate. I'm like, no, no, no. I need to know what you actually ordered. What did you go over with the patient? Come to find out when I looked at what they ordered, they ordered one EKG. Well, I'm sorry, but ordering an EKG, that's one unique test. And you have to have three from reviewing external records or notes or reviewing results of a unique, unique test or ordering a unique, unique test or an assessment requiring independent historian. Um, so you, you were not going to get that. That's, you actually fall down to minimal or none if the only thing you did that day was an EKG. So you have to complete categories, not just one test. And when I see a provider put something in there saying this is moderate, it's actually not truthful in the note. 
And it's kind of like tooting your own horn. You're basically saying, this is what I did and I'm great and it's it's now moderate or it's high or it's low or whatever. Please don't put those generic statements in your note if you're a provider listening to this. And auditors who are listening to this, please, and I hate to use the word educate, but you know, ask your clinicians and your providers to not use the verbiage that's in the auditing tools. That's for you to determine if it's moderate, if it's low, if it's high, based on the documentation of that individual patient. And that's one of the biggest keys. And so one of the tips I'll give you again, when it comes to, let's say, prescription drug management, because that's a big one. So let's say that you had two chronic conditions, uh, two or more. They were stable, but the physician went into some detail as far as what they were, maybe atrial fibrillation, um, maybe uh, the patient also had high cholesterol, and let's say the patient also had osteoporosis. And this provider was following that patient, uh, gave the complexity, but said that the patient currently is stable, no new issues and no complaints, and following the, the medical regimen set up by that physician. Let's say that they didn't need to order a test, but said they would recommend maybe a um, bone density scan at the next visit. Okay, I'm concerned. I'm saying this is primary care at this point. And then let's say the moderate risk uh, was prescription drug management, and the patient was still on uh, maybe two medications, maybe on Coumadin, and they were monitoring that as well. And that also, let's say that um, the patient also had a high cholesterol medication and was doing well, and they gave the levels of their current um, cholesterol levels, but they were stable and being monitored. Well, right there, that that shows that that is management. They listed the medication. They said that they're, you know, still on their current. If they gave any refills, you know, for how long, how much, it was dated. I can't tell you how many times I see prescription drugs and no date for refills or for um, new prescriptions. And you can't just make the assumption that it's the date of the encounter. It ha- You have to know what it is in that note. So it's very important that physician um, not only put the date dates, but specify each prescription drug being refilled and why. And this not only helps with choosing a level of service, but it also helps bolster the accuracy and the thoroughness of the respective patient's medical record, electronic or otherwise. It just gives now the note credibility uh, when you try to actually bill for, let's say, a level four in that situation. And so those are that's one key that I, I really want you to keep in mind if you are auditing that level for that particular problem. Now, another thing that as an auditor, you may be asked to look at, and I know this seems like a stretch because it's not necessarily have to do with coding or documentation, but you might be auditing a compliance issue in your practice, and that's eligibility issues. One thing that happens a lot in practices, and I see it more and more, and that is Medicare patients, especially if they have Medicare Advantage plans, but they give you both a Medicare card and a Medicare Advantage plan. So a patient will come into the office with two cards and think that they have both and one might be secondary, but they don't. They usually have the Medicare Advantage. I've seen them sign up on it um, for it on TV. But because the front desk doesn't want to argue with the patient, they just let it go and they enter it into the system the way, you know, they know it's correct. But you really need to not only educate your front desk staff, but also the patient, because the patient will have an expectation of no out of pocket, especially with the confusion now with No Surprises Act, where patients think that they can't, you can't balance bill them, meaning that you can't bill them the difference between what was billed and what was uh, paid because there could be some um, adjustments from the contract, but you can still bill them their share of cost. And at that part, that definition of balanced bill hasn't been clear to patients. So it's important that if that comes up and you're asked to audit um, the compliance practices or the workflow practices, make sure that the front desk, the anybody who's checking el- eligibility, anyone who anybody who's touching the patient's insurance card information, they need to make sure that they check that while the patient's in the office because those issues come up, you know, face to face. Now you're going to run into some problems if you're doing all telehealth and that's another reason why it's important to have the patient periodically come into the office because you want to get updated information and it's really hard sometimes to get that through a virtual appointment. So make sure that you're looking at that. It'll stop the denials up front, but that is another form of an audit that I think is important that everybody understand that everybody seems to just focus on E&M services, but 
there's sometimes some workflow audits that are pretty important to make sure that you're you're looking uh, specifically at what the patient's insurance is and do they actually have coverage and are they eligible to be seen today. Okay, so I'm going to look at my coding question today. And this is an interesting one. So this one, um, it's very similar to one that came up in a, a I was listening to a webinar with um, Coding Intel. I love Betsy Nicoletti's information. It's really good. And I got the same question. So it's a version of this question. But basically, it was about an ER setting. So in the ED setting, um, the emergency physician and the um, surgeon saw a patient and both provided critical care. The emergency doctor provided 30 minutes of critical care, and the general surgeon documented uh, 40 minutes of critical care and performed a procedure. So they wanted to know if the FS shared visit modifier for 2022 would apply. Actually, here's the answer, and it's very similar to uh, Betsy got the same question. So that basically, let's say that there was a um, procedure that had zero to 10 global days before. So if that was the case, let's say it was a colonoscopy. So, and they did, you know, critical care before for a GI bleed or something, they were really concerned. 25 modifier, you can actually add that to the critical care and then do your procedure. If it had a 90 day global, yes. And you remember critical care is under the ENM service guideline. So that would be added to the critical care services as well. If the critical care, and I think this was actually the question because they, they had the wrong modifier. If the critical care is after a procedure that, that's global and it's related to the procedure, you can't bill for that because that's included in the payment. That happens sometimes with bypass grafts or um, you know valve replacements, uh, colon resections, and sometimes the patients just don't tolerate the surgery and there's some critical care involved to stabilize that patient. And I know that some providers want to charge for that extra. And it's been clear in the final rule that that's included. But critical care after a procedure that's unrelated to the procedure and at a different encounter, then you would have a critical care code based on time, at least 30 minutes, and you'd use the F as in Frank, T as in Tom modifier, so FT. So keep that in mind that you need to know who actually gets that. Um, the, that critical care. And when it's an emergency department provider versus a surgeon, they would have their own critical care. So if there's any overlapping, you're going to see some pushback because it's individual for that patient and it should be at a different time. The other thing is that emergency department physicians, even though the rules say you can provide critical care in the ER, I've noticed that place of service 23 sometimes kicks it out. So be aware of that if you see any denials. Sometimes that place of service is a problem. So always look at, at that um, just from a compliance standpoint and a billing standpoint, or um, you could see some denials there as well. Okay, today's uh, coding question is brought to you by Gold Bond Ultimate Healing Lotion, Skin Therapy for Nourished, Healed, and Healthy Looking Skin. Gold Bond Ultimate. So I hope everyone um, that was able to attend our telehealth two day summit last week, it was so great. We just had just a great speakers, a great turnout and, uh, and actually offered six CEUs. And if you're still interested in that, um, please direct message me or email me and we'll make sure that uh, we show you how to uh, purchase that. If you're still interested for that information, we had seven sessions, two Q and A's and everything was uh, recorded. So it was pretty nice. Now, my personal tidbit for today is basically just some cautionary tales. So I have very fair skin. I'm very Irish. And um, it, I sat out in the sun, went to the beach with my husband today. It was so nice, the damn recording. And uh, we just had some beautiful weather. But it's February, so and it was a little bit cooler. It was maybe 72 degrees. And those of us are thinking, oh, why do we need sunscreen? Yeah, guess what? I'm a tomato. So, um, you know, a cute tomato. But I'm just saying, I got very red and I have definite lines. So those of you make sure because we're not used to going out. I mean, it's been two years of kind of staying inside and going out a little bit, but we need our vitamin D. We know that that's been linked to, um, you know, getting COVID easier and not recovering. So we definitely need to get our sunshine in, but use your sunscreen, use your sunblock, know the difference. If you've got some spots, have them checked out 
and just make sure you're protecting yourself. Otherwise, and especially on your scalp as well, there's some spray and stuff. But uh, start getting that. You know, I know some of you are still in snow thinking, what is Terry thinking? But if you are in sunny states like I am, it's important that uh, you take care of that and make sure that you're protected. All right, everyone, I will talk to you next week. Make it a great day and a great week. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music.